Greetings, changelings and changeling adjacent types. Puka here with a short announcement. Because this week's episode is on the subject of homebrew, it seems like an appropriate time to mention that we are looking for contributors to a slate of projects for Changeling's 30th anniversary in 2025. If you're interested in working with us over the next year to produce a bunch of books for the Storyteller's Vault, please check our social media for information on how to apply. Links to those outlets can be found in the show notes to this episode as well. We hope you'll consider helping us making this celebratory dream a reality. And now, on with the show. This is Changeling the Podcast. Welcome to Changeling the Podcast. Come for the glamour, stay for the vibes. I'm your host, Josh, and with us is your other host, Puka. Say hi, Puka. Welcome in. What are we talking about today, Puka? We are going to be using the Changeling 20th Anniversary Edition rules for kith creation in an attempt to build one of our own and see how it goes. Yay! It's a time-honored tradition to make up a kith, so now we actually have guidelines. (laughs) So, yeah, what kith were we thinking of? Well, as I have alluded to many times over the two seasons that we've recorded so far of this podcast, I am a fan of nymphs. And in the first edition especially, it seemed quite clear that nymphs were a distinct kith. We never got a write-up for them, but we have at least one statted example in the texts. And then second edition, as we get closer and closer to an anime The Secret Way, the idea of nymphs gets slowly more and more aligned with that of the anatomy or in particular the kubera. And mm-hmm. I've always kind of resented that. Because, yeah. That's you a know, lot of them else. Yeah. They're very different in a lot of ways. So mm-hmm. that's the motivation. Mm-hmm. And how much will we be following the sidebar of dreams do not follow rules? In our I like that sidebar. I, yeah. I like that. It has the Emerson quote at the start. This is on, page 114 for anyone following along in the C20 core book. But yeah, I think it's important to remember that perfect balance isn't and shouldn't be the final determiner of Mm -hmm. creation. Yeah. I think also like if the think of these as guidelines, not strict rules to follow, I think there's a time and a place for strict rules to follow. And I think making a kith and changing the dreaming is not one of those, maybe theoretically a, sixth edition of changeling the dreaming could be one but that would be very different game so (laughs) all that being said i did kind of go through this process with the in the back of my mind thinking if this is for public consumption i do want something that can fit pretty neatly into whatever game because i think you can you can get away with more imbalance if it's like just for your own game and you're just throwing this in there i also have the guideline in general for art of following the rules is really good when you're learning Hmm. and then once you get more towards mastery that's when you start screwing with it because i think knowing when to break the rules first requires knowing how to follow the rules if that makes sense at least for this type of thing but how many kiths have you created in your time would you say none really oh okay. yeah there's so many kiths here i I might have (laughs) tweaked one but like i've never been in a situation actually where i'm like oh i need a kith and it doesn't fit anything here yeah that's i mean i i respect that it's just i feel like yeah. most changeling players at one time or another have created at least one and i i, I include myself yeah if but it's also it's it's very kithane heavy games that i've been in mm. if i was trying to run something from a different culture that i was also knowledgeable about yeah. like that i wanted reflected there like I could see with some potential players I might have, maybe I'd need to help someone with Nunahi creation for a new kith or something. Because what we have existing, I don't think is... I tend to run games where I live, and where I live, there's not enough Nunahi there. That's <laughs> fair. Like yeah, yeah, no, that's them. totally fair. Or like someone from some other culture. Yeah. Mm. And in regard to creating kiths from other cultures, we have a listener question at the end where we will address that more directly. Yeah. But in the meantime... Yeah, so shall we get started? Let's do it. So yeah, so it starts with step one, concept. Uh, it's the most daunting step, really. Yeah, that's that's sort of what stopped me. 
like from doing it. I'm like, I don't yeah. have a new concept for a kit. Like, well, the advantage of the nymph kith, the two advantages of the nymph kith are both that they're well established in folklore and there's precedent in the game for them. So that's mm-hmm. already like two things that make it easier. But also, I would say most of the kiths that I've created in the past have been from stumbling across some idle piece of folklore and going like, oh, hey, that's cool. And thinking almost immediately thereafter, how would I put that into a changeling game? So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I guess okay, for concept, there's the easiest or hardest question. I think imagine it depend on when <laughs> you're doing it and what's going on. What is it about the kith that you find compelling? Yes. So I do academic work at the intersection of linguistics and geography. And there's what we could call an aura of place that people tap into very regularly, whether it's like neighborhoodism or just this is my favorite place for X because of Y or or whatever, or just a sense of place like in general that they have. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like the kind of thing which over time could be built up into entities that represented that idea. Not anything powerful enough to be a god, although one of them might claim to be, but something invested in the continuing affection or strong emotion of humans who lived in a place or regularly visited a place. So nymphs in folklore have elements of that, particularly when you cross over into from Greek into Roman mythology and they get sort of conflated with the idea of the genius loci. So Mm -hmm. spirits of places, mostly natural places, who guard and protect them and who can do favors for the ones who come and like leave offerings or do rituals or whatever. I see that as separate from an inanime because the inanime express particular elements and particular landforms and are bound to physical anchors. Yeah, and also the gilly do also. Yeah. uh... I see as these, yeah, related, but these are still very distinct. So I... the Gila do to me are like the ones who teach humans how to engage with the natural world, and mm-hmm. that yeah, it's related but subtly different. So like those three, the Anatomy, the Gila do, and the Nymphs, all kind of form a trifecta that yep. approach from different angles to me. Yeah, that's actually one thing this book doesn't have that I would want to throw in, but like what makes this distinct from what's already in the game Mm, mm -hmm. is is a good question. Like, yeah, there's how many hundreds, there's over a hundred kiths published officially. Yeah. That sounds about right. (laughs) Yeah. So you're going to have trouble coming up with something that's not like at least vaguely similar to something else. So you do want to think of what is different about this kith from those. So, yes. So we have the actual questions. The first one is appearance. How do they look? Mm -hmm. Traditionally, they're very beautiful, almost perfect versions of humans so very similar to the she i imagine the one statted nymph that we have in the game is kukui who appears in immortalize shadows on the hill and he's a hawaiian nymph and he's described as looking like a very pretty young man but with like dark brown skin and green hair like a tree so i like the idea of having something that's she like but with radically pronounced elemental skin tone, hair color, eye color, those sorts of things. There is also in the Roman tradition, the idea of the genius loci taking the shape of an animal or having an object emblem. But I kind of wanted to stay away from that here because we don't really see that in the game. And I don't want to step on the puka toes too much. Yep. The next question we have here is magic. What kind of magic do they do in the dream of them? The inspiration of them? Mm -hmm. Try to fit into this framework Yeah. (laughs) So because they're the spirits of place, obviously they should be able to control the place where they live to some degree, probably geared towards protection and preservation more than anything else. Again, with Kukui, we see bits of this where he seems to be able to perform little automatic effects and kind of merge with the different landforms in his domain, etc. But also I want them to have magic that helps their residents, in particular dreamers, the ones who believe in them and make offerings to them and defend them against harm. So I see their magic as being very place-oriented and person-oriented. And that'll come into play later when we talk about affinity. What kind of dreams inspire the nymphs? I think that part of it has to be the place that they represent has some kind of enduring idea about what it signifies to its people. And it has almost a sort of I guess I'll call it a centripetal force or a gravity 
on the mood of narratives that take place within it. So like if you have this pristine glade where all of the locals know that's where the freshwater spring is and there's always these flowers in springtime, then everything taking place there becomes bucolic or pastoral to some extent. Mm. Or but if you have a haunted house, then everything becomes spooky in a haunted house, you know. So the way that the dreams of a place build up over time that becomes manifest in the kind of person the representative nymph would be. But then there's also the dreams of like a tutelary spirit, you know, mutual support and benefit between a place and the people who honor it. The tie between Mm -hmm. the humans and the place that gives them a community identity and it gives the anthropomorphized figure who represents the place some kind of life. Yeah, because, okay, so we're talking about different dreams here and the the book sort of presents it as like one dream. So is this... Are there like very different nymphs? Are there like nightmare nymphs and dream nymphs and does it depend on how the place is? Like I think that they would be as differentiated to some degree as the places that have meaning for mortals. But also mm-hmm. I didn't want to get too into the cross-cultural aspects of this. I am localizing mm-hmm. it to the Greek and Roman conception because that's what I feel I have more claim yeah. to and know well. But I would say in different cultures, the idea of the function of a place spirit or a place fey like thing that differs around the world. You have things in Southeast Asia called city pillars, where it's like a monument that is kind of like the center point of a community. And the way that people engage with it there might be in a context, a religious and a spiritual context that's different from the one that I'm thinking of. But I do think there is a lot of variety in what we would call the tutelary spirit of a place. Yeah, because I was just thinking more of like the dreams, like this is also overlap of dreams of river hags. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And dreams of the she, actually. With the... Foreshadowing a bit, the birthrights yeah. and frailty are connected to those as well. <laughs> yep. Okay. And then the last question has in this concept category is human life. Now, this is presupposing we are talking about a changeling here. I am talking about a changeling here, very okay. specifically. <laughs> okay, good. Because yeah. I think the one example we have was like true fey nymph presented. It's like somewhere between a lost one and an Arcadian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the way that I see it is the changelings who become nymphs are born and raised and generally never leave the place where they establish themselves. Mm-hmm. They're the kind of people who would do everything they can to foster positive growth in their domain and repel, Mm -hmm. you know, erosion or disaster or whatever. And socially they would be fixtures in the community for better or for worse. I don't Mm -hmm. see them as liking too much attention, but I see them as like, Oh, there's that guy who nobody knows their name, but he's always walking around the block or whatever, like that kind of people that you recognize their face and kind of maybe have Mm -hmm. passing interactions with. And they seem to like know all the business of everything going on in the immediate yeah. area. So it's almost bogging like too. There's a lot of Yeah, perhaps. But less involved in like a specific home mm-hmm. or a family or whatever. And just kind and of these are very focused on a natural environment. I mean, natural can get funny, but you wouldn't have like a hearth nymph. I was kind of thinking about that with the next question that comes up about their role in the dreaming. Mm-hmm. The C20 book suggests pointing to media for examples. And even though there's not many nymphs that are like in popular fantasy properties and stuff, aside from mm-hmm. ones adapted from epics, I did have a couple ideas of like, if I had to point to Seely, I would say figures like Galadriel, who's kind of bound to Lothlorien, mm-hmm. but has this like she-ish presence or Tom Bombadil also drawn Tolkien. In Sandman, you have Fiddler's Green. Maybe more unseely, uh, Mononoke Hime from the Miyazaki film, or Blair Witch from the Blair Witch Project, or even the Bridge Keeper in Monty Python and the mm-hmm. Holy Grail. So, some of those concepts that I'm thinking about of like figures who are clearly mysterious and powerful, but seem really intimately tied to a specific place. Okay. Yeah, let's move on to their role in the dreaming, and that's sort of in the changeling setting in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess the first question would be, how long has this kith been around? I guess as long as humans have settled in places, you know, as long as they felt ongoing connection to mm-hmm. specific places. 
And I would say the nymphs probably see themselves in relation to the inanime in the same way as the she see themselves in relation to the commoners, like Mm -hmm. a little bit elevated, a little bit like, oh, we're the firstborn, even though they might not necessarily be at all. Yeah. And then without any of the dreaming reinforced superiority in the Fey realm and everything. Yeah, but they also have a bit more of a human tinge to them. Like, So another idea that I was kind of kicking around was maybe these were the Inanime who, rather than go into slumber, underwent the Changeling way and just started reincarnating. Oh. Yeah. Because I don't think we really get that anywhere in the game. Mm-hmm. It doesn't even suggest it as a possibility. So it's... Yeah. To your earlier question about natural versus non-natural... I do like the idea of kind of representing the Inanime Gladeling versus Crofted distinction in there. So they could Mm -hmm. be associated with a Glade, or they could be associated with the area around a Freehold, Mm -hmm. as long as there's some sort of source of glamour in the place in question. But they're very... Inanime are thing, which could be in a location. These are very place, which might have a thing there. Yeah, and I think that what determines whether an inanime arises in a place or a nymph arises in a place Mm -hmm. is the nature of the dreams of the mortals who come to it. If they're coming to that little pristine spot out in the wilderness because there's that one rock that they leave their offerings on, then a gloam is probably going to show up. If they come to that spot because it's a ritual ground and they have all kinds of ceremonies there and it's like the trees and the water and the fires they light and all of that, then a nymph would arise. That's sort of how I see yeah. it. I mean, other ideas related to doing the anime, but that's kind of off topic. So let's get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I do also see them as kind of like what the she should have been in the sense that they're mm-hmm. local and not ruling over a place, but they're responsible for a place in like a Fisher King kind of way. If the she yeah. hadn't gone all feudal, then maybe they would have been more like mm-hmm. this. Maybe a very long time ago. Yeah. In anime, nymphs and she were the same kith. And, but that was like a very, very long time ago. The deep history. Speaking of history, what role did the nymphs play in history and specifically mm. the Accordance War? Yeah. The Accordance War shout out is something in the C20 book. I'm like, why does everyone have to have participated? But... <laughs> yeah, I guess I you could ask say, what they did and what was it like in there, but yeah. I would guess that they just kind of stayed out of it until someone threatened their chosen home and then they would mm-hmm. defend it to the death. So fairy in anime like to Yeah. Well, and it raises the question of when the she came back and all the freeholds flared to life again, or a large number of them flared to mm-hmm. life, did that awaken a whole bunch of nymphs and how did they respond? So Yeah, I haven't hashed that one out quite as much, but I would say they're generally removed from politics, although they see themselves as nobles in their own way. I would also count them as Galane, most definitely. Okay, that's important. Did they play any other role in history, Kithian history, that you're like a shadow or thought of? Going back to the question of artificial spaces or crofted spaces, if Mm -hmm. I can call them that, another thing that Changeling as a game doesn't really dig into much is the idea of glade-like spaces that arise from non-nature-based dreams. So to me, mm-hmm. like I think a very beloved and storied theater or library or museum should very much have natural glamour that can be absorbed and turned into a freehold in some cases. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, you know, it's kind of like, why do some places become more famous than others? And in part, maybe it's because some mm-hmm. of them have this fey being reinforcing the dreams of the mortals that created it in like a positive feedback loop or something. Okay. So they're very much based around a place. Like, so you're not going to have a nymph that's in a hidden place that mortals don't know about really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. An anime can be there. Yeah. But not nymphs. Okay. And let's say modern day, uh, modern setting. What role do they play in Kithane society? Definitely caretakers and stewards of whether glades and natural glamour or some other more confined source of glamour. But then also I would see them as experts in local knowledge, because again, they know everything going on around them and maybe like lore keepers as well, a little bit of bargain as well, managing events and organizing things and doing all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. In relation to court and freehold or Motley, how would they fit in there? I would say the Sealy Ones inspire mortals with beauty and comfort and nostalgia. 
and the unseely ones instead create fervent passion or foreboding. They probably rely more on mortals happening by than going out and seeking them, but it's not impossible they'd have other methods of gathering glamour. Folklore nymphs are very sexy, so <laughs> there's that possibility. There's also certain myths that um, that give them like prophetic powers. So kind of they can engage with those strands of their mythology from a seely or unseely perspective, I would say. I also think rapture specifically would be them creating a work of art that successfully captures the aura of their place mm -hmm. regardless of court in a freehold they're the ones tending the bale fire and guarding it maybe bog and troll mix with like a dash of she <laughs> mm -hmm. and then in a motley this was maybe the hardest one to think through because generally they don't travel much they're the ones who stay in yeah. headquarters and offer support but i guess if they do get out of the house once in a while they would be protectors first and foremost they could be the ones who decide where the motley is going to camp every night and in their role as lore keepers they might have knowledge that comes in handy when the group is kind of going into the dreaming or going to an unfamiliar kind of place yeah i just realized maybe it's because of my larp background i think your games travel a lot more than mine do <laughs> <laughs> so like mine is like what do you mean getting around much looking for campsites like that <laughs> Well, mine, anyway, mine yeah. travel, but not far. Like, yeah. I don't do globe trotting. But... Mine would be like, I'm trying to think of it, if I've ever, with the exception of certain dreaming excursions, I can't think of a time you would have traveled more than like a half hour car ride. In hmm, any interesting. Game I've run. I think part of that is also borne out by the peripatetic lifestyle that I tend to lead. So it's like, mm. that also uh, plays a role. Did we want to get into birthrights? Let's do it. Okay, so how are we doing this? So there's, we want to go. Through, I guess we want to first go through the factors and then, yeah, say how that relates to this. Yeah, the first two steps of the process in the yeah. core book are kind of those lists of questions, and then it gets into like the actual. Please consider these things when building these mechanics. So, mm -hmm. so I guess for the there's three factors to consider, and there's three types of birthrights. So it's like engaging the mythology where you want to find some sort of folklore to fit into, right? Like, mm -hmm. if you're following Changelink's thing, it definitely doesn't have to be too close to it. But I mean, even folklore in general, there's this idea that people think that, like, it's very canonical and this one thing is like, no, that's just the one version somebody wrote down sometimes. Yeah. There's, it's usually, there's a lot of variation there. Um, Hundreds to thousands, usually. <laughs> yeah. The, the twin strands that I want to focus on here are their beauty and their locality. That's mm -hmm. like the two main pieces. Yep. Nymphs is a good starting point. Yeah. Uh, you want to think about how they deal with mortals because yeah. if you're a modern fae, you have to. So. so in the mythology, their beauty is often a liability. And that I always found interesting, kind of like in an autumn she frailty kind of way. You know, what happens when the mortal adores the nymph too much or the god adores the nymph too much? And there's also bits about like, oh, they can strike people blind with their beauty or whatever. But I would also say they bestow favor on the mortals who honor their space. And I want to have some way to reflect that as well. The example for kith building that they give in the core book is the Domovoy, which are Russian sort of house spirits. And I believe they have a birthright that's kind of like helping out the family that they're bonded to. So instead of a family, just the locals. And then the last one, it's called Tell a Good Story or Telling a Good Story. I think this is also, it's not just a good story, but like have a fun game. Yeah. Like you want something Ideally. that'll, yeah. Well, to your point about traveling or, or not traveling, yeah. I think that there isn't enough in Changeling that are like comedies of manners or bottle mm -hmm. shows, you know? And I yeah. think nymphs would kind of help facilitate those or courtroom dramas maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have court dramas, but not court rooms. Yeah, dramas. you can't have it all boggins for that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so those kinds of stories, those kinds of chronicles or chapters even that are set mm -hmm. within more confined settings. Yep. And then they have like three types of general categories of birthbirds, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, they have acuity, magic, and advantage. So I think yeah. we should go through what these are because I don't think you're going to get all of the types fitting. No. <laughs> Be too many. Yeah, so acuity is when you're just better at doing something mundane 
And the exemplar that I think of is the Boggins, who are just faster at crafting things. Magic is magic. I think magic is kind of the catch-all one. Like, they have some kind of power that doesn't easily fit into the other two. It's magic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then advantage just gives you dots of things on your character sheet. Yeah. Advantage frustration should exceed one dot for physical and mental and two dots for social attributes. Yeah. Is that just like trying to fit the sheet? (laughs) Basically, yeah. So I'll start with that one because that's that's the most straightforward. They say it's the easiest to create, and I agree. I do kind of want to just port in the she birthright where they get plus two appearance, and if they invoke the weird, people are kind of dazzled by their beauty because it does fit the nymphs. Mm -hmm. The alternative was I was thinking maybe like plus one appearance and plus one charisma instead, but I think just raw appearance is probably more on point. Yeah, that fits. Do you have another birthright? Because does she have... Yeah, the she also have their can't look like fools birthright, mm-hmm. <laughs> so. which is always kind of me. But <laughs> yeah, they do point out that you can sometimes hitch an acuity birthright onto another one, like a minor one. Mm-hmm. So the can't botch X rolls can sometimes. Yeah. Drawing from the anime, what I think I would like to do for the nymphs is that they would either be able to gather glamour from nature, like the Nunyi or the Gildu. Or, the one that I think I prefer, they get bonus successes on cantrips when they're within their home area, which is an anime mm-hmm. power in the Secret Way book that I don't think they brought into C20. But basically, the closer they are to their anchor, the more automatic successes they get on cantrips. I mean, that would be bad for an anime in C20. So that's... Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to bring that back and apply it to the nymphs. And I guess I'm trying to determine both how many successes they should get and what the extent of their home area is. The number that I wrote in my notes was like 10 meter radius for each dot of glamour they have. Like they have to pick a central location and then within the surrounding zone, they get some bonus number of successes. It would probably also have to have an aspect of the anime anchor where if their home is destroyed in some way, they have like a limited amount of time to find a similar new place to establish residency. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I like, I think like a, almost like a realm affinity, but like an extra one for the, where they are. Is mm. what you're sort of looking at mechanically. It's more powerful than an affinity though, because it's, it's automatic successes. Yeah. So yeah, automatic successes. Yeah. The only thing I would think about is like plus two appearance. I mean, we talked earlier, it's like, Oh, it doesn't have to be perfectly balanced, but there is the whole, like, when you're directly comparing to she, if they have another birthright that really seems a lot better than the she birthright, and the other one's exactly the same as the she birthright. The thing that distinguishes it is because yeah. it their birthright doesn't move. Yeah, so it's just in that location. So I think yeah. that, that does... Some balance is needed. It's not a perfect... It's an art, not a science. Yeah. But yes, I think that... I just wanted to somehow capture the what we see with Kukui and Shadows Mm -hmm. on the Hill, where he does seem to be able to produce these minor magical effects almost at will within his domain. Mm -hmm. And that element. I always like that. Anything you don't have to roll. Yeah. Maybe that should be it. Maybe it's, they can do cantrips automatically, but with only one success or something. Yeah. That's good. If they, and only there. Yeah. Yeah. And they still have to spend glamour if it's a weird cantrip ops. Yeah. All right. I I want to look through the arts to see if there's a, yeah, certain cantrips you're like, mm, I don't know about that one. But <laughs> which one needs to be banned? Hmm. Maybe it's only up to a certain art level. Let's think about this. But yeah, that's a good. Story. Or maybe just only chimerical cantrips. They yeah. can do whatever they want on the dreaming side, and then mm-hmm. you know, yeah, because I'm just thinking it's like you get Pyro's five, Pyretics five. That could be a problem. That's true. Even with even <laughs> with one success. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe just only level one cantrips, or I don't know. I'll yeah, I'll take. Let's a think look. about that. Yeah. But yeah, let's go into their frailty here. So it's the same idea. There's three factors and then three types. Mm-hmm. So the factor, the first one we have is story possibility, which is very similar to the telling a good story from the birthright consideration. Like you want to think about, you want to make it so it makes the game more interesting and not just closes off interesting possibilities for the yeah. game, I think. There's applicability where it can't be something that like never happens. <laughs> And you can you can raise that between like the, the talks about the slua they whisper all the time but whispering is not that big a deal versus the selkie coat thing where it's like it means nothing until someone steals their coat and then they're really screwed so yeah 
and then uh, just avoid direct damage of just it tends not to work well it, i think it sort of violates the good story possibility principle really but yeah and then you have three different types it talks about compulsions which is something you must do or not do a curse which is like a supernatural weakness that kicks in at a certain time and then ineptitude you're really bad at something but i mean <laughs> i have to talking loudly mm-hmm I'm not actually sure where like the she Arcadian she frailty fits into this. Oh, but curse! I would say it's curse. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the frailty is called Benality's curse. So. That's true. Yeah. So, what are you thinking for? The, I'm assuming it's something being tied to a place. But yeah. So along the lines of the river hags or the oba, where if they spend too long away from their home area, they get some kind of. See, for for those two, it's damage. Oh my goodness, this is an Oba. It's very similar to an Oba, this. It is similar to an Oba, yeah. Well, and the yeah. Oba are similar to the She in many ways. Yeah. But I, I didn't like the damage piece. I think I would rather mm-hmm. cleave closer to like the Morganid where they lose glamour, or in this mm-hmm. case, maybe gain banality. So the draft that I have is, after a week away from their home area, the nymph gains a point of banality each day that cannot be removed until they return. So it means they can kind of short-term travel, but then once the clock mm-hmm. runs out, it starts very quickly, like they need to get back. Yeah, they got, by three weeks, they've already gained a dot for sure. So that's not good. Yeah. yeah. And it's something where, again, finding the right balance is important. It's like, oh, maybe they should just roll a banality trigger instead, but I don't think that that's severe enough. Do I want it mm-hmm. to be just points of banality or do something well, else? Well, it depends on how frequently they get a banality trigger. Well, I mean, if they got an automatic one every day that they had to roll, but I think giving the temporary point is a yeah. is a better frailty. So mm-hmm. the other thing is that all of the ideas being kicked around, and I think this applies to anybody who's doing a kith building, is if you are torn between ideas and you have to ultimately pick just one, anything to the side, keep it as like a possible kith directed merit or flaw. So. The Autumn She Adoration, for example, is something that would really fit well. I don't want to do it as their frailty because I don't want to make them too much like the She, but yep. I could absolutely see that as a flaw that's like a more intense version of the whatever it is, surreal beauty thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think another thing to keep in mind when doing this, they don't really get into, but is uh, the storyteller and player are going to have to keep track of all these things, and especially with frailties, mm-hmm. but it, it could be an issue with birthrights too you don't want to make it too complicated to try to do that. Yeah. Like, like you could easily do this like, Oh, this would be the perfect system that does just the right math. But it's like, you need a spreadsheet to like figure out how long you've been away and exactly how far. No, don't do not that you did that, but it's just a good thing to keep in mind for. Yeah. I do worry that the Arcadian chief frailty is also about gaining banality, but I think it's distinctive enough. Yes. That it wouldn't be too. And simple. we've already said this has like, maybe they're distantly related. That's, yeah. And then it gets into, you have to pick a realm affinity. Yes. They give a few suggestions for what each one should be. So it's like, if it's a kith that's very heavily steeped in magic, then it's probably fey. If mm. there's, you know. I really just want to give them scene, even though the book yeah. suggests this is for fey who travel a lot. But I think it no, makes sense. No, but I sense. think in this case, scene <laughs> makes perfect sense. They are about a location. Yeah. Again, this is advice. This is not rules. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on what we saw in Denizens where they had two affinities? Or was that depending on their aria or was it? No, I think they just had two. <laughs> yeah, that I wouldn't do that for a change line, I don't think. Mm, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the sort of backups that I had in mind were to do a double barreled thing and say like, if they're from a natural place, they would have nature. And if they were from a more human centered place, they would have mm. actor. That's okay. I think I'm fine with that one. It, it's too, They don't get two at the same time, but some of them get one, some of them get the other. And especially since you've described this as it's more like a category or family of kiths than like really one kith because the mm-hmm. themes are so location dependent. But uh, the other thing we have to still, actually before the birth of reality, you did say like what happens if something happens to their place that needs to yes. be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the birthright, the first birthright write-up is going to be a very extensive one, just like you described. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And the book actually doesn't cover this in here, but there's some other bits you should, you kind of need, which you already sort of talked about. You'd also want to write up in, in all their Kith descriptions, you have 
childling description, yes. wild oh, distinctive yeah, yeah, yeah. grump description, revelry, which you mentioned the revelry and unleashing. I mentioned the rapture, not the revelry. <laughs> yeah, the revelry. Sorry, the revelry as well. Yeah. You have to pick a revelry for the kiss. Two. I don't know if we prep for that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I do have a revelry note where okay. I just said they have to participate in some kind of celebration of their place. So if the mortals are having like a happy hundredth anniversary to the park or whatever, then like okay. that would be. So it wouldn't be enough if like in the park they had a movie night. It'd have to be like about the park. Uh, I think that's probably fine too. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to think about specific cases. Yeah. As for unleashing, I think the effect would feel like the entire place is casting a spell against Mm -hmm. whatever yep so and then for seemings i mean part of the reason i pointed to the media properties was because that was kind of what i had in mind for at least wilders Mm -hmm. and grumps i'm still trying to suss out how i want childlings to seem but Mm -hmm. yeah i think media can be really helpful for fixing those ideas in one's mind yeah and then it says adjust is necessary i'm not sure yeah (laughs) the only thing that I would adjust is actually more of a general game mechanical thing. And the nymphs are almost an excuse to bring it back in. But way back in first edition, it was possible for scene to be a primary realm. Mm -hmm. And I think if anyone's going to be able to cast cantrips on scenes, it's nymphs and maybe a few other kits. So I haven't like hashed out the, how to update the mechanics for that or anything, but it's something I'm thinking about. That almost becomes the birthright at that point, I think. Well, and that's why I wanted scene for their affinity was to kind of play off of that. But I also don't think it should be just the nymphs who are able to do it, but maybe they're the ones who know firsthand and can teach others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have anything we want to say about your nymph? I think that's, you know, that's what I've got in my notes. If you have any suggestions to add, mm-hmm. then I mean. And then it's <laughs> oh, so it's finding yourself or someone else to do some amazing art. Yep. Well, yeah, there's <laughs> that too. Yep. The good thing about nymphs is that there's plenty of public domain oil paintings to yep. draw from. If eventually mm-hmm. this turns into a small storyteller's vault kiss book, I will be well prepared. Hopefully. So do you want to get to our listener questions? Yes, we do have a few. Mm-hmm. So, Luna Andromeda Vebe asks, how powerful is too powerful for a custom birthright? Well, the guidelines are pretty clear, at least in terms of, like, number of dots and difficulty adjustments and stuff. But that mm-hmm. magic option, that's the tricky one. I think, again, this is not a hard rule, but if you get to the point where you're like, this is as good as a cantrip, especially yeah. since you don't need to add realms and all the bunks and you probably made it too powerful unless it's like, this is their only good birthright and their frailty's nasty. And even then maybe like for a changeling, like an anime and stuff are different at the level of probably less than what you would think is a good cantrip. I think. I would say cantrip wise, if it's like a level one cantrip, yeah. that might be okay. But when you think about, you know, Solomon's breathing fire, like Pyretics four, it's like, uh, maybe not yeah those are more okay with just because they're not changelings and it's like a different the other thing to think about is we never thought about for the nymph and you stretch goals is uh the augaman yeah or the art that i have notes sketched out for Mm -hmm. i'll say no more about that (laughs) oh yeah specialty art specialty merits and flaws specialty art i i would like to hold forth very briefly on specialty arts (laughs) yeah very special treasures that fit nymphs you know well because all of those things i think are both helpful to conceptualize because it's kind of like as you go through your ideas if you don't want to sacrifice any ideas and you don't want to pick and choose remember that there are those other categories of thing in the game that you can shunt Mm -hmm. ideas into like arts yep. and realms and treasures and merits and flaws and houses and, <laughs> and houses but the same thing applies to arts as to kiths when it comes to are you covering something that has already been covered in the game and to mm-hmm. c20's credit i think that the what are we up to now 20 arts they really do cover almost every case imaginable for yeah like folklore inspired gaming i think there are a few gaps but really think it through (laughs) i think for c20 if i were to instead of creating a new art i would steal from wraith and have Mm. essentially alternate cantrips yeah yeah, so like 
we have to come up with rules of it and stuff, but like an alternate level three of Wayfair or something, right? Like that yeah. kind of thing might. And that is something I'm kicking around for the nymphs. Mm-hmm. Next is Chig's question. Am I the only one who doesn't like all the additional <laughs> kits that get added officially and officially to the game? You're definitely not the only one, Chig. Chig also states that he thinks that the way Changeling the Lost handled the splats did better than the Dreaming, which I think is an important corollary to... Although Changeling Lost did have a ton of things called kiths. Yes. I don't know if will just mention. But Lost did a... If you're familiar with Werewolf the Apocalypse, it's more like that, where you get... Do you remember the terms for these? Uh, there's seeming and kiff. But then there's a third thing, isn't there? Court. Court, okay. So yeah, seeming you have like fairest, ogre, you know, whatever those are. Mm-hmm. Kith are like almost like prestige classes in D&D. Like yeah. I remember I played an elemental hell diver and that was one of my favorites. And then spring, summer, autumn, winter for the courts or various other ones. And- yeah. So it's kind of like they lost just sort of had a category. So you'd stick your, uh, there should be like, I don't know, red caps and trolls could be the same team seeming maybe. And- seeming also is like their physical aspect and the way they do it. So on Discord, my response to Chig was to kind of say you could thread the needle between the way Lost does it and the way Dreaming does it. Because Lost, the seeming, you get one birthright and your frailty, and it's kind of grounded in your physical form or your metaphysical form. And then your mm-hmm. kith adds another birthright or blessing, I guess it's called. So yep. I think you could adapt that to Dreaming, where you have the kind of universal concepts like trickster house spirit whatever and then zero in on the specific expression from a specific culture to add one more frailty yeah shout out to charlie cantrell's changeling fifth edition hack that's sort of tilted towards this but an example might be that if you were to do a puka in this system they would get something from the trickster concept something from the shapeshifter concept and then something specifically pukish Mm -hmm. unique to their folklore so that's yeah I think one way you could still have a wide diversity of kiths, but also make it a little bit more yeah. fungible. We're getting to the Oba in a future book, but they would be like Ishu mm. and whatever the Ishu are and whatever the Shi are. <laughs> Stick them together. And, and a dash of River Hag. Yeah. Well, that's what you've got now, actually. <laughs> yeah, basically, again. yeah. But uh, but you prefer the dreaming system? Yeah, I find... This might sound weird. If I find when people try to make all-encompassing categories, I get really nitpicky. If you just don't put in a category at all, I'm fine. Like, if you're just like, this kith is this kith. Okay, cool. There's like a hundred of them. Fine. But if you had like, there are five kinds of kiths. And I'm like, wow, are there really? And is this really in that one and not another? And shouldn't there be a sixth one sometimes? So, I mean, I don't mind the dreaming system. But at the same time, I can see how a lot of people look at it and assume that they're talking about silos. And I don't yeah. think that that was ever even intended in dreaming. Like yeah. there's always been, but I, f- I find Lost still has the kiths, and I think that still has the same kind of problems of Xylos. Of yeah, you're in that kith, but multiple kiths are within a seeming mm-hmm. potentially. And then there's the whole Dark Ages Fey approach where they just <laughs> build your character, make shit up. Yeah, yeah. So then Andrew Goodman, who is very familiar with making kiths asks Mm -hmm. how do people approach developing kith from other cultures by which i mean outside the eurocentric origins of the main c20 lore where do you start how do you balance fitting them into the established meta while still trying to respect and showcase the culture you're drawing from i've got an answer do you have an answer (laughs) well first of all i will say there's actually problems with this even with european kith that's part of my answer too (laughs) yeah like this can happen so first of all if you're from a non-European culture, at least in part, drawing from your own culture to make a kith, like, go for that, for sure. And in general, I found, like, if you're respectful for the culture, and if people who are into role-playing games would be cool with it, you're, I mean, you can't ask everybody, you can't, and you can't be like, oh, this one person said it's fine, therefore I'm definitely fine. Mm-hmm. But, like, anytime you're in this space, you're taking risk, I think. And, Yeah. To circle back to what I said at the start, there's also that difference between designing a kith for your table versus the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like if I was designing a kith outside of a culture, especially like outside of European culture, I'd probably be doing it with a player who was from that culture at the table. They wanted to play this. They have something from their folklore they wanted to bring in and I'm helping them make that kith. Yeah. 
And then maybe it'd be like, hey, do you want to publish this with me on the storyteller? Form? Yeah. They were <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I think regardless of your background, I think this applies to all kiths, Eurocentric or otherwise. The mm-hmm. first and most important thing to do is to cross-check and cross-reference as many sources as possible and look for the consistent threads. So yeah. one of the first things I ever did as a Changeling fan way back in yesteryear, I used to go to this, I think it was just called like mythos.net or something, but it was all, it was like a pre-Wikipedia clearinghouse of myths and folklore where people sent stuff in. And I ended up going through and digging out all of the water themed ones and just making watery kiths. And I went through about 10 of them before someone was like, Hey, did you hear about this book blended tides? And I'm like, oh, man, that, but that was my first experiment with it. And that really taught me how you can't just say, Oh, I'm going to make this folkloric creature into a kith because that folkloric creature has so many variations as we discussed. So going yeah. from, source to source, reputable sources. You can start on Wikipedia, but scroll down to the end of the page and follow the links. That's my advice. Yeah. And then following that, like you said, finding a knowledgeable informant from that culture to weigh in on them. And that applies regardless of, you know, if you're from a European culture and you're writing into a different European culture, it's still helpful to get that perspective if it's not your own. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think it's also a lot of the kiss we have are more than one culture mm-hmm. and sometimes that's good sometimes it's bad there's some problems with like when we did get the book knockers that brought that up where it was like yeah definitely yeah but i think in general like you can have i don't know if you're doing a different type of sea kith i mean there's a <laughs> lot of places on the ocean it doesn't it's have true. To be. yeah well and when i say consistent threads as well that yeah. you want to look for i would say to focus on the story-based ones. So -hmm. don't worry so much about like, oh, what are all the cool powers in folklore? I don't think cool powers should ever be the motivation for creating a Keth. Mm -hmm. Look for the stories first. Yeah. When it comes to quote unquote non-Western Kiths, we have to consider how the Kithane function in many ways in the game as like a proxy for colonialism and consider Mm -hmm. how the people who gave rise to the kith you're designing might have had their dreams impacted by that history. So working their in-game history around that, I think, is a form of due diligence to that topic. But you shouldn't define their entire history around it. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you're presenting the kith through a kithane lens, make it clear that the kithane's perspective is a limited one. And yeah, that I think is also important. Yeah, that also gets a big thing. Like, are you making something that's kind of kithane or something that's very not kithane? And, and that gets all, what does that galling versus kithane thing even mean? And Yeah. Like, you're talking about your nips being definitely galling. I mean, that could have been kithane quite easily. With the... Yeah, so all of that is to say, I would never tell anyone they're forbidden from trying to make a kith based mm-hmm. on some piece of lore that they've encountered. But I do always encourage people to like, the further removed you feel from that culture and the more fraught your culture's relationship is with that culture, the more background research and background work you're going to have to do in order to do justice. And you may end up, you may speak with people who say, I don't want you turning this piece of my culture Mm -hmm. into a kith and you have to respect that. Yep. And if you have different people saying different things, that's a whole other. Eh. Always err on the side of the person who says, "I don't yeah. want you doing this." Yeah, yeah, but For it gets. Sure. In, but if you're if you're working with some anyway, but yeah. like one also thing like that really comes up is like as a rule of thumb, if you're doing it from another culture, imagine somebody from that culture who grew up with these stories is playing at your table, and you're bringing in a character of this kith. What are they going to think about it and think about you? Like mm-hmm. at least do that level of thinking about that because it could i've seen that go where somebody just did not do that it wasn't a change like but i've seen that kind of thing before it was just like if you actually sat down and went through that exercise you would not have done this (laughs) but yeah but that's my Mm -hmm. thoughts on making the fey yeah so yeah you can find us at changelingthepodcast.com you can send us a toot uh, changelingpod at dice.camp. You can send us an email, podcast at changelingthepodcast.com. You can join our Discord at discord.me slash ctp. Patronize us on Patreon slash changelingthepodcast. We do have a YouTube channel. We will be working on that for changeling the, changeling the Podcast on YouTube. And, oh yeah, our Facebook group, Changeling the Podcast, which is some nice conversations in there lately. Mostly nice. Yes. 
Lively, if nothing else. Lively, yes. <laughs> and uh, all the links will be in the show notes. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Missed my cue there. Sorry about that. And once again, I'm Josh. I am the one known as Puka most times. And look forward to my new kith based on the dreams of podcasting. Oh, God. Every beautiful myth deserves a kith. European nymphs have had to contend with the EU's protected designation of origin labeling policy for natural products issued in their domain. On the one hand, the banality of packaging and trademarking the foodstuffs of a specific cheese cave or vineyard is a leaden blanket that the kith must contend with. On the other, the dreams of distinction such labels foster mean that few edibles are as potent a vehicle for enchantment. Remember, your next bottle of champagne or wheel of Parmigiano Reggiano could be nothing but a vessel of dreams and nightmares. This public service announcement is supported by our patrons, who know the value of a special designation because they get one at the end of each episode like so. Derek, Dorchidas, Oreo, Razkabuz, Sanchiger, Sija, Terry Robinson, and Tricerabeth. If you'd like to become a patron, you too can get such a shout-out along with other benefits, including the draft text for the upcoming Kithbook Nymphs. Sign up at www.patreon.com slash changelingthepodcast today. You can also support our show by leaving a review on the podcast platform of your greatest convenience, and our Discord is always welcome to you at www.discord.me slash ctp for more discussion. Thanks very much for listening, and until next time, keep on dreaming.